Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, John, it's your turn. What'd you pick? I picked a story by Joyce Carol Oates called The Lady with the Pet Dog. The man was carrying something. It looked like a notebook. He sat on the sand not far from Anna's spot of the day before, and the dog rushed up to them. The child approached the edge of the ocean timidly. He moved in short, jerky steps, his legs stiff. The dog ran around him. Anna heard the child crying out a word that sounded like Ty. It must have been the dog's name. And then the man joined in, his voice heavy and firm. Ty! Anna tied her hair back with a yellow scarf and went down to the beach. The man glanced around at her. He smiled. She stared past him at the waves. To talk to him or not to talk. She had the freedom of that choice. For a moment, she felt that she had made a mistake, that the child and the dog would not protect her, that behind this man's ordinary, friendly face, there was a certain arrogant maleness. Then she relented. She smiled shyly. A nice house you've got there, the man said. She nodded her thanks. The man pushed his sunglasses up on his forehead. Yes, she recognized the eyes of the day before, intelligent and nervous, the sockets pale, untanned. Is that your telephone ringing, he said. She did not bother to listen. It's a wrong number, she said, her husband calling. She had left home for a few days to be alone. But the man, settling himself on the sand, seemed to misinterpret this. He smiled in surprise, one corner of his mouth higher than the other. He said nothing. Anna wondered, what is he thinking? The dog was leaping about her, panting against her legs, and she laughed in embarrassment. She bent to pet it, grateful for its busyness. Don't let him jump on you, the man said. He's a nuisance. The dog was a small golden retriever, a young dog. The blind child, standing now in the water, turned to call the dog to him. His voice was shrill and impatient. Our house is the third one down, the white one, the man said. She turned, startled. Oh, did you buy it from Dr. Patrick? Did he die? Yes, finally. Her eyes wandered nervously over the child and the dog. She felt the nervous beat of her heart out to the very tips of her fingers, the fleshy tips of her fingers. Little hearts were there, pulsing. What is he thinking? The man had opened his notebook. He had a piece of charcoal, and he began to sketch something. Anna looked down at him. She saw the top of his head, his thick brown hair, the freckles on his shoulders, the quick, deft movement of his hand. Upside down, Anna herself being drawn. She smiled in surprise. Let me draw you. Sit down, he said. She knelt awkwardly a few yards away. He turned the page of the sketch pad. The dog ran to her and she sat, straightening out her skirt beneath her, flinching from the dog's tongue. Tie, cried the child. Anna sat, and slowly the pleasure of the moment began to glow in her. Her skin flushed with gratitude. She sat there for nearly an hour. The man did not talk much. Back and forth, the dog bounded, shaking itself. The child came to sit near them, in silence. Anna felt that she was drifting into a kind of trance while the man sketched her. Half a dozen rapid sketches, the surface of her face given up to him. Where are you from? The man asked. Ohio. My husband lives in Ohio. She wore no wedding band. Your wife? Anna began. Yes. Is she here? Not right now. She was silent, ashamed. She had asked an improper question, but the man did not seem to notice. He continued drawing her, bent over the sketch pad. When Anna said she had to go, he showed her the drawings, one after another of her. Anna, recognizably Anna, a woman in her early thirties, her hair smooth and flat across the top of her head, tied behind by a scarf. Take the one you like best, he said, and she picked one of her with the dog in her lap, sitting very straight, her brows and eyes clearly defined, her lips girlishly pursed, the dog in her dress suggested by a few quick, irregular lines. Lady with pet dog, the man said. So maybe we should mention that this is our hundredth episode and I might cut that out. It's very it's very momentous occasion. <laughs> but why don't you go ahead and tell us why you wanted to pick this story, I guess. Well, we brought it up in that episode we did on that Lori Moore story referential. Because we were trying to think of different examples of stories that have been rewritten by other authors. And um beside the Greeks, I thought of this one. Joyce Carol Oates uh, rewrote a Chekhov story, which is also called The Lady with the Lady with the Little Dog. And so I thought it'd be interesting come back to that idea and actually tell you this time like hey this is based on another story <laughs> right 
Had you read this one before then? Or were you just aware that she had done this? No, I, I read it a while ago. Just, you know, just read it and forgot about it. I didn't do it. Like it wasn't, maybe it was, mm-hmm. I was pre- prepping for a class maybe. And I was trying mm-hmm. to decide which stories to include in the class, like in the syllabus. And uh, oh, sure. Um, I don't think I wound up using this one, but maybe I did. Yeah, it was my first time reading both. And obviously I like Joyce Carol Oates better. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I think the Joyce Carol Oates is, it, it's more modern. It, it like takes a different perspective on the story um the other one's based on man's perspective this is a woman's perspective there's and she handles it in a more kind of narratively interesting way so there's a lot to be said for this version yeah that was um kind of my main thought in terms of like looking at it from the angle of craft was like you know she starts with she starts kind of in the middle of the story and yeah. Chekhov's story starts at the beginning. And I feel like what I don't like about older stories, and I'd have to really think about some of the ones that we've read, but I feel like what I don't like about older stories is this feeling of the narrator just saying, like, I'm going to tell you a story and I'm going to start at the beginning. You, you know? said something similar when we did the White Heron story. Yeah, I probably hated that. <laughs> Sarah Orn Jewett. Yeah, that's okay. Because what you get with the Joyce Carol Oates story is dropped into the middle of the drama. And with, with the other one, the other version, and it's kind of like, all right, let me give you a little backstory on this guy so that you understand the kind of guy he is when I tell you about this next woman that he comes across. But it's not as interesting as just introducing the woman that he comes across and, and learning through his interactions what kind of guy he is and was. It's kind of nitpicky because like the original is still powerful and that it captures that same sentiment of like, you know, the, the despair, the hopelessness of this kind of pointless affair yeah obviously what i like about the modern one too is that and we don't really get a sense in the modern one of whether or not either of these people has had previous affairs like you get the sense that the female narrator has not had a previous affair we don't really know about the man though and in this in the checkoff version it's like this guy saying starting out by saying he's a piece of shit womanizer he's been doing this a while <laughs> yeah he's been doing this a while and that kind of immediately for me just i have less sympathy for this guy because he's trying to convince himself that he of all the women that he's cheated on his wife with, this one is the best. And that's why it's so devastating. But it's almost less believable because I'm sure had we read a story about his previous affair, he would have felt similarly devastated. You know what I mean? It's like you get increasingly devastated. Every every uh, heartbreak feels like the worst until the next one. And um, I liked this Joyce Carol Oates version because if it really is both of their first affairs, it doesn't make it less forget- like more forgivable, but you can kind of understand like how they're spying spiraling and why you know it's not because they're they're frequently cheating it's because they're for the first time doing something that illuminates the fact that their lives feel extremely hopeless right she felt really unhappy in her marriage but it wasn't until she stepped outside of it and realized that that wasn't going to happen for her that even stepping outside of it wasn't going to fix the problem that she became really torn up about it like to the point where she's like self-harming i think the checkoff one the way he outlines like the beginning is like the guy had a bunch of of Affairs, but none of them were were they were all temporary. They were all yeah. you know ephemeral. And yeah. in this one, for whatever reason, the way it's depicted is the way that the narrator insists on yeah. to be understood is that for some reason this one stuck in his head and he had to go seek her out. And he went to the, yeah. the town where she lived and, and found her. Where it's a little unfortunate that I couldn't just read the Joyce Carol Oates one without the Chekhov one because every time I read it, yeah. I have that Chekhov one in mind. So I always right. assume that it's the same guy. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. I try yeah. to tell my Myself, it doesn't have to be the same guy, but you know, that's how I understand him. And we don't get his sure. internal. So I I usually understand him as that guy. And at the beginning of the story, where she starts the story is with him returning and just appearing out of nowhere, like he does at, at the theater. Was it an opera? Yeah. It's she had like, the glasses uh, and the thing. Yeah, but. yeah. I think in the second one, they say theater both times. So I'm thinking play both times, but it turns out they're both musical yeah. performances. Yeah. So it starts with him returning and like coming back to her, finding her and insisting like, we have something, we have to continue it. Although in the track of one, he chases her down. And then this one, he calls her the next day or something. So Joyce Carol looks like keys in on that moment as being like the pivotal moment. That's why she starts with this. And I think the track of one has that is the same the pivotal moment too because that's what distinguishes this relationship from his previous ones so it's an interesting matter of craft to like start there right yeah i started off making a different point and i ended up 
<laughs> and else. I was going to say something totally different. I got lost. Yeah, because I think we were kind of on the vein of like, uh, what, like you were talking about, like, I'm trying to tell myself this isn't the same guy. Oh, yeah. Like how they feel about the affair. Yeah, but in a certain, from her point of perspective, because the story is about her, it doesn't fully matter what his background what his story is he's mostly um mostly a vehicle for her yeah. i read that beach scene because you can read it it's, it's for, told from her perspective and she feels like she's the one making all the decisions there but if you think of him as being like this um lack of a better phrase consummate adulterer like he knows exactly how to get to her right yeah he's like i'm gonna do these drawings and that's gonna i'm gonna act uninterested but i'm gonna do these drawings and make and see if she's interested yeah we don't get as much of a sense of him in this story where Whereas, like, in the Chekhov one, I feel like we do know a little bit more about the woman, you know, like, the other party, even though, like, we're focused on the man. So, I don't know. I kind of like that, too, because she's looking at this guy, and there's things that she points out that are specific to him in this Joyce Carol Oates version where, you know, oh, she likes that he's, like, really kind to his blind son, and, like, he's an artist, obviously. But then, like, even in the, when she describes, like, being driven home, there's, like, things that she's looking at doesn't like about him, you know, like, the way he, like, physically looks in that moment, and, like, I think his over overall behavior in that car in the car ride she's scared too yeah. you know there's a the kind of like uh, the rationalization the kind of um, confabulation you make like oh if he's gonna abandon me here on the side of the road then i'm gonna find the things i don't like about, out about him yeah. so i can begin disliking him now right yeah so yeah there's definitely some of that going on I guess my point being that I was able to read this version of the story and like I said, enjoy a little more because what I felt like it was capturing was less like how great this man was, how great their connection was and more how hopeless she is. Yeah. And in the original, the guy's trying to convince himself that this girl's really special out of all the girls. But all we really know about that girl is that she's a sad sack. (laughs) She's like young and she cries a lot. I'm like, I don't, I I mean, she might be the hottest one, but I don't know why you like her the most because every time you guys are together, it sounds fucking awful. Whereas like with this Joyce Carol Oates one if this is her first affair she doesn't have other affairs to compare it to she certainly has other men to compare him to but you know I think what she was experiencing in terms of their connection was that it was you know kind of easy and they're on the same page and it felt like fresh i wouldn't even call it exciting it was just kind of like new you know like i'm sure she was excited but like the whole thing was just kind of like tainted by this sadness right because she arrives at that vacation home on her own without her husband having already like decided she needs time apart for whatever reason she was in trouble before that yeah yeah she's like in a headspace where she's just gonna go and like she's not looking to have an affair but she's already like questioning things and i feel like in the Chekhov one it's like the man that's married like he's just gonna stay married whatever but the girl that he's with is she might be going through it but she's also like 20 something you know like she's she's not experiencing the same kind of like dread from the same like point in her life there was just something a little more mature about the joyce carol Oates one you know so it felt more real that way i really liked the way she handled kind of um you get it in the interaction between them like they're different mental spaces you know yeah and this this last um it's like right in, before the ending but she keeps asking him over and over again like declaring her love or asking about love and the way he answers is like it's a really good way to show the disconnect and she's like so you love me you love me she asks why are you so angry he answers right he, he doesn't address it and then you know a little while later she says it says i love you so much she whispered please don't cry we have only a few hours please like he he, he'll never say it right yeah but just that we always talked about dialogue and where people aren't necessarily connecting in the dialogue they're not directly answering each other they're they're pursuing their own ends through dialogue and this is an example of that where because they're emo- they're in emotionally different places in that moment their reactions they're what they're saying to each other doesn't miss like it's still hitting but they're just hitting differently you know yeah. he's reacting to different things and she's trying to put out there yeah i did notice that in that conversation she's like so desperate like looking for some kind of confirmation he just like doesn't give it to her yet yeah. he's like he's still like calling her yeah well <laughs> yeah i mean i hate this guy he's a douchebag but yeah and then like just in terms of the overall like craft of this story is i just like that it kind of starts with him reappearing you know yeah oh the structure of this is wonderful yeah the structure is so much more fun she starts with the thing and then like backtracks to like kind of where it started or how what led to that and then we go to another one yeah and then it backtracks again and revisits those scenes and we get to like revisit scenes a couple of times 
Yeah. And just build up and it just builds on itself. Working backwards is amazing. When I was reading the original, I talk about this all the time, like in workshops and things, when you're reading someone's story and you can tell how many paragraphs are left, how many sentences are left, how many pages are left. So you get the sense that things are wrapping up and you're wondering what could possibly happen, right? And with the original, it's like there's a couple points and it's broken up by like sections too, like one, two, three, whatever, where the guy's like, oh, and that was it. We were never going to see each other again. I'm like, well, then what the fuck's the rest of the story about, you know? So those emotional like points they don't hit you know it wasn't as if i was anticipating that he was going to track her down and like surprise her at a theater or necessarily that they would get back together but i'm like this is not the last interaction yeah you know? it's like this story is left. called the lady with the dog and there's 10 more pages so yeah i think the lady with the dog plays a part in those stages <laughs> right whereas like joyce carol oates like she does two things with that structure the first is that you don't necessarily know what's happening you know it's more exciting to read it you can't just predict what's going to happen but it also like de-emphasizes the ending the ending is not like the point whereas the checkoff story it's like will they or won't they end up together and it's so much less satisfying than just leaving us with like the emotional devastation in the joyce carol oates one you know the ending was am- i really like this ending you know where she joyce it, carol oates one yeah the, the oates one because she comes to a um a realization you know it has a real emotional ending where she's like i'm gonna go you know kill myself and she's like you know what no what am i you know this is like all meaningless yeah <laughs> and i think the structure of it really helps get to that ending in the right place even though it happens at the end it still the structure helps get us there with a stronger impact than you know i don't know for sure but i feel like it's a better impact than had it just been linear is that what you think the conclusion was then because yeah she's like talking about like oh, i'm gonna go kill myself and then she's like no actually what i've learned here is that uh like what i'm chasing is like a really good feeling like i want to be with this guy um is this she realized does this suddenly, man was her husband suddenly joyfully she felt yes. a miraculous calm this man was her husband truly yeah yeah you were about to read this part this man was her husband truly they were truly married here in this room they'd been married haphazardly and accidentally and another part of the city she had another husband she had not betrayed that man not really this man whom she loved above any other person in the world above even her own self-pitying sorrow in her own life was her truest lover her destiny and she did not hate him she did not hate herself any longer she did not wish to die she was flooded with a strange certainty a sense of gratitude of pure selfless energy it was obvious to her that she had all along been behaving correctly out of instinct what a triumph to love like this in any room anywhere risking even the craziest of accidents yeah i read that as um being she's finally resolved the conflict right the conflict of how can i live these two this bifurcated life if i love this part of it so much right and i'm so miserable in that other part right and yet you know the love makes her miserable in both of them right (laughs) So yeah. she, if it read to me like as a, as a solution, as a, um, you know, a clarity where she figured it all out. But what do you think her clarity was? Cause my, I, when I read it, I was like, I feel like she's going to like relieve herself of the guilt of having stepped out of this because she loves this other man. Yeah. I think her, her conclusion is that her first marriage was a mistake. Yeah. And that, um, she's going to try this other guy. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, you know, the story ends and I don't know the logistics of that. And I don't right. know that it matters. It's the emotion is what we want to leave with. Right. Like if she's going to try to get a divorce or if she's going to try to keep going with the way things are, status quo. But even the ability for her to accept and, and realize the status quo is what she really wants and no longer have that conflict is something, um, is a change, right? If yeah. that is what it is. So I don't know that I never, I didn't think about it too clearly. I just felt her emotional catharsis and okay. like was like ah it's a satisfying ending <laughs> yeah <laughs> that makes sense. yeah yeah whatever she decides to do you're right she's like come to a conclusion herself and i kind of like that he's not even necessarily privy to what that means yet because it's, it's less about what it means for them as much as what it means for her like even if she doesn't end up with this guy she's like you said deciding that that first marriage was probably just a bad thing and, she, and she's gonna be okay she doesn't have to kill herself to like i don't know like there's a way out of this feeling it's difficult thing in prose to 
have an emotional ending like that. That's all happens inside the head, right? Yeah. I, I struggle with this in my writing. It's like you have to make a switch, mm-hmm. but it's an emotional kind of mental switch. It's not. It's not like there's two doors and like you can have the character walk through one of them, right? Like a physical action that kind of. And a lot of times, what I do is I try to set up a physical action that like will indicate what the mental change was, and you try to hint at the mental change, but then the physical change sells it, right? Right. Whereas here. It's all internal. She doesn't yeah. do anything very specific, except, you know, suddenly it's like, why are you so happy? What's wrong? He's, she's happy. He notices that she's happy, yeah, which is something. But what we've just experienced is all internal. Right. It, there's that whole paragraph. She stared at him and it seemed to her in that instant. And suddenly, joyfully, she felt a miraculous calm. Like we're totally into like what she's feeling. Yeah. And that's what's being depicted in, in the prose. I, like I said, I struggle with how to do that. Yeah, because the Chekhov one, the way my translation ends, they're like talking about like finding a solution, ta- like finding a plan together. So it's like very much like plot. They're hopeful. They're like, we're on yeah. the brink of it, but we haven't gotten there yet. But we think we can do it. <laughs> yeah. And if we want to just dive into the prose level stuff, yeah, Joyce Carol is obviously really good at this. But um, you talked in previous episodes about varying your uh, your syntax, like yeah, the yeah, sentences yeah. and stuff. Like her command of English and just like when to drop in a fragment, a sentence fragment that just kind of encapsulates as like a feeling, and like when to get into a complicated sentence. And her prose is uh, spectacular, yeah. you know. And then when to just do like some like the section I read at the beginning of the episode with the little pulsing hearts at the end of all her fingers to like describe this strange feeling like yeah that kind of imagery and um, sensation i don't know there's really good moments in just the writing word choice yeah just as an example there's it's near the end it's right after i love you so much she whispered please don't cry we only have a few hours please or we have only a few hours please this paragraph it was absurd they're clinging together like this. She saw them as a single figure in a drawing, their arms and legs entwined, their heads pressing mutely together. You know, this um, appositional kind of structure that to that sentence. Then helpless substance, so heavy and warm and doomed. That's a fragment. Yeah. It was absurd, a re- repetition. It was absurd that any human being should be so important to another human being. She wanted to laugh. Here's a colon. She wanted to laugh, colon, a laugh might free them both. And then the paragraph ends, new paragraph, she could not laugh. Yeah, I that was the section that I looked at when you said fragments. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she, yeah she's she's great. Even like the way it starts. I mean, we talked about the structure, but this, that first sentence is strangers parted as if to make way for him. There he stood. He was in the aisle a few yards away watching her. That's pretty cool. I was, I mean, I read the Chekhov one and then I read this one. I was trying to remember if strangers parted as if to make way for him were lifted right out of his version of it. I didn't go and check, but, and then there's a problem of translation. So I'm not sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You can't really appreciate how well the original was done or. But the original had that same moment, right? That same yes. kind of. Yes. strangers parting right which is uh it's cool when you're able to do that or i, I kind of want to try rewriting another story like i was actually thinking, oh yeah like, yeah for sure wouldn't it be cool to like write an Orestes story which is you know a greek uh story when I, I, I really like that and just you no know, just take the characters and write it and see see what that's like yeah maybe it turns into something else maybe it becomes modern day i don't know i haven't dived into that i don't know how it's gonna right how it would turn out but is that your takeaway no maybe it should be i might <laughs> actually take like that might literally be what i take away from this I'm <laughs> yeah, gonna exactly. right i'm gonna tell someone else something i'll <laughs> give them other advice yeah <laughs> i think my takeaway is just how much more exciting this version is when you just kind of start in the middle like this and especially for a story like an affair where you know the fact that it started is pretty typical you know there's a unique set of circumstances around her way of how this started right guy at a beach with a blind kid versus any other affair story but that's almost less interesting than this like what happens here in the middle of the story which is that he comes and like finds her and she's like what is going on like why is he here so that's really interesting to start there and like i said i don't like the original the way it starts because it's like let me tell you about this guy that gets into this affair and why this affair is very important to him it's like just start just start the story and then obviously what she ends up doing with you know i guess they're flashbacks but it just feels like she's telling the story out of order almost it doesn't feel like let me go back to the beginning it just feels like kind of disjointed you know you don't get like a warning when the other sections start 
start. It's just like, oh, this is when they met, I think. So that kind of stuff's really fun too. And then you could tell us how they met later. But I just like stories that just get right into it. Especially, like I said, because affairs, are it's a very well-known structure of a story. Yeah, I was going to have a similar take. My original idea for a takeaway was to have a similar thing about the structure. Because one of the things I really liked about this was how it revisits scenes. You know, the first section ends with um, she and her husband, you know, he's... <laughs> They're trying to have sex. She's not really into it. He's yeah. doing his best. But then that that comes up again and other scenes come up again as she's retelling it, as it's revisiting these moments. And like you get further, you get more depth with each retelling. And I think what happens is like so that when you get to that moment where she's finally telling how they met, how she and the man met, you know how it's going to turn out. And it kind of gives their meeting more it, it gives there's like a, an umbrella over the meeting that's like colored by everything that we already know about what's going to happen. Right. But I like that. So that was going to be my original takeaway was like thinking about structure. But I my t- I wound up my takeaway was going to be just about that what I mentioned before like building to an emotional catharsis. But I think those things work in tandem. Like sometimes an emotional catharsis isn't the development of that isn't necessarily plot linear. You know, right. So this structure really helps get us from because if the original affair was just one time on the beach kind of thing and she was going to leave it behind, but then he showed up at the theater and insisted on continuing it and she went along with it, like that moment seems is also really important. Right. So is that where the emotion starts? Like Chekhov starts with the beach. Miss Carol Oates starts with the theater and then they go, they come to slightly different endings. But I think Joyce Carol Oates chose the theater because the emotional arc she was building starts there and ends where it ends. Right. So being able to to follow that emotional arc through that really cool structure that you were talking about, like doing that out of order stuff. You know, and to generalize that too, I think thinking about plot structure and emotional structure and all the different kind of like arcs that you would have, like what is the character, where does the character start and end? What is the emotional journey? What is the journey of actions that the character takes? And like how all those things line up with each other can help inform what the story structure should be in order to best show us as readers with that progression. Right. Yeah, I think I could see myself like messing around with like a version of the story, like you said, like, to, you know, you might rewrite like a Greek one, but this one seems like if there's not already like a version, a modern day version of it, there should be. Oh, yeah. It's see what time. George Saunders does with it. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> I would love to see that. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys, for listening to our 100th episode and counting. Yay. <laughs> Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash whyisthisgoodpodcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.